Hey folks, it's Brian. Something's up with my mic this morning, so if it's a little damped on the sound, just just turn up the volume a bit. Okay. Continuing with the Red Book of Magic. Crack. Previous spell, we didn't know about this, but there were some <laughs> comments I need to make, right? GM concerns. Maybe that's all start game. I have a GM concern about this spell. It must be cast on a non-living, non-magical object. Good to go. Not a problem there, book of people, right? right? If a spirit lives in the item, you have to come with power. If a spirit lives in the item, does that make the item magic? Because the next sentence is doesn't affect spell matrices, doesn't affect crystals, also does not affect elf bows of magical nature. Are there non-magical elf bows? I suppose there might be. I just don't think so. Um, and get another piece of this, right? Temporal magic, whether it's spirit or rune or sorcery, does not make the item immune to the spell because it's not magical, right? It just has magic on it. However, it appears that temporal magic does create a resistance to your non-magical item against the spell because the caster can boost with magic points to overcome the magic, same paragraph, next sentence, of temporal spells. So if I got Blade Sharp 2 on my, my broadsword, Crosser's not magic, crack should work, but it's got two points of blade sharp and crack is two points. So does it overcome it or not? It doesn't say. It says you can put magic points to help boost to overcome, but there's no like, is it a resistance roll? Is it like counter magic and um, dispel magic and all that stuff where you have to have over to take it out? Or it may drop back? I don't know. It says you may also boost with magic points to help penetrate shield, counter magic, and other defensive spells. There's, there's some convolution going on here. Okay, create bonfire. Uh, each point increases the fire's diameter by a meter. Um, if there's no substance for the fire to actually burn up, it quickly dwindles back down, right? It can be cast on a fire mental, but does nothing. Adds a cube, well, maybe it's volume. Adds a cubic meter to the fire elemental, but doesn't increase its hit points, doesn't increase its, its damage. So, the way I do elementals, because mine are small, one hex, medium, three hex, large, mega hex, that would increase the space that it actually occupies. So, a two hex small fire elemental could actually burn two people at once if they're standing next to each other. So I can see an effect then. Oh, I can use that. Here we go. Okay, create bridge. This is kind of cool. Creates a shimmering band of crystal, 10 meters long, a meter wide, and a centimeter thick. You know, the band must be on something solid on either end, or if they're stone or something, right? Nearly indestructible, strong enough for wagons and horses. Good to go. Reach room point stack increases either the width or the length. Um, and several people can cast it simultaneously together. Nice effect. Um, oh, and it kind of mentions here that, you know, throw extension on this thing, right? So it stays there for a long time. You actually build a real bridge over it and use it as a frame. I like that idea. Okay, create fissure, old one, no questions. Create flippers. Turns the target's arms and legs into armored flippers. Triples the swim skill. Their swim movement becomes eight. Movement on land becomes three. Their skin becomes leathery everywhere, providing three points of armor in all hit locations. This is added to any armor received from the Transform Head Turtle spell on page 99, or the Plasteron spell on page 68. Yeah, flippers cannot perform any manipulation skill. Um, I'm guessing this is probably a Hershen. I don't have sorry, sorry. I don't have this. If I had written down, I could probably pronounce it better. But you know. Um, Shape changers, probably shape changing cult. Changing the turtle. Maybe. Okay. Create foe cursor. This is kind of cool. It's a, it's a troll spell. 
um, is cast on upright log near a troll village with a skull placed on top. When the spell is cast, the caster then fills the skull with magic points. Um, it cannot be refilled. So once the magic points are gone, it's gone and it crumbles. If it's a troll skull on top of this log, it acts as a detect enemy matrix, right? So foes passing within 50 meters, the skull is out. The skull expends one magic point, right? I mean, it's a subsonic howl. I mean, anybody in the village know, hey, there's somebody coming. If there are other skulls on top of it, they do different kinds of curses. Um, the curse affects the other skulls throw unique curses upon those who, okay, so anyone who passes within 50 meters of the skull, the skull will expend a magic point and do its thing. But in order for this, the curse to take effect, the skull has to overcome the target's power with its magic points, including the one it just passed. says these curses penetrate counter magic and similar spells as a two point rune spell because the create foe is a two point spell. Blank. So if you have counter magic 111, that's a spirit magic one, right? Yeah. So if you had counter magic one up, it would take your counter magic down. If you had counter magic two up, the spell would not work and the counter magic would come down. If you had counter magic three up, Spell just doesn't work. If I remember how counter magic works, kind of a funky effect, but okay. And then types of skulls: amphibian. Um, you can only cast one magic point per melee round. Max it out. If it's a bird skull, you become night blind. If it's a fish skull, their land movement is halved. If it's a carnivorous mammal skull, they lose one hit point for every five minutes they're within range. Range of the spell. Is that the 160 meters of a rune spell or the 50 meters they keep talking about on this spell? I'm guessing the 50 meters. But anybody who's within 50 meters and takes a point of damage, I think they'd be able to figure out where it's coming from and we'll get out of range. But that's, that's just me. Okay, I hooved a mammal skull. Causes demoralize. And a reptile skull um, causes minus 20 to all physical skills. Cool. Okay, create ghosts. Binds the spirit of a sacrificed victim to the area as a ghost. Sounds pretty straightforward. The priest, could be an issue, right? But the priest must successfully engage in just one round of spirit combat. That means it doesn't even have to win. Just engage for one round and the binding is in effect. So if you sacrifice the victim with a lot of power and a lot of charisma, it doesn't matter how powerful or charismatic they are, you just engage them for one round. I think you should have to engage them in spirit combat and drop them down to zero magic points, then they're bound. That, that, that's my take on it. Okay, create great markets. Same, no changes. Create head. Well, this is cool. Thantar Cult. I got to play with this a little bit in my first campaign because there was a Thantar Cult that the, the uh, players were, were uh, not investigating, but messing with. And um, so I, I kind of played with the old RQ2 rules for this kind of stuff, but having the rest of this really, really is helpful. Okay. Must be cast on Thantar Holy Day. Requires a lengthy ceremony in which the head of the victim is removed with a silver garrote. The ceremony requires eight hours a day for an entire week to prepare the victim and the priest. It creates a permanent living head that lasts until it's destroyed. Cool. The head has a mental connection with the enchanter. Uh, magic points are available to the caster. I guess that's also the enchanter. Why we're changing words mid-sentence, I'm not sure. All spirit magic, room magic, and sorcery spells known by the victim are usable by the creator of the head. Uh, Rune points that the head holds that get expended are not regenerated unless the caster is also a, an initiate of that rune be, of that cult because runes are cult flavored, right? Makes perfect sense. 
uh, get them to the okay the heads, heads creator can also use all of the heads knowledge and magic skills up to the creator's intelligence times five or the victim's skill level i mean i think they mean percentage <laughs> whichever is lower right the lower of the two um and it talks about these mad head ghosts which is really kind of cool um and if i would have known about this i probably had a few of those running around inside that, that temple okay the first time the first time user okay the first time a caster uses this spell they have a five percent chance of gaining a chaos feature that increases by five percent each time they cast this spell and there's a little chart here on what kind of chaos feature they get half the time it's a curse of bed uh, sometimes it's both a chaos feature and a curse of fed. Okay, once a chaos feature has been gained, there's a non cumulative, I can't say things, I'm sorry, guys, 3% chance per use of the spell that a further curse of fed feature is gained. Okay, and they have this little paragraph here about how you know, people don't like people playing with chaos and, and the there are cults designed to take out chaos that will just take you out because you're chaos, and even though they don't know you're part of that. Okay, create market. Standard one. Do have an issue on, not an issue, a GM concern on this one, right? Okay. When physical or incorporeal enemies of the caster cross the barrier, or when a spell is cast across the barrier, the create market spell emits a loud sound to alert everyone. Good to go. I had no problems with that whatsoever. At the end of this spell description, it says, unlike warding, it's on page one, two, create market only activates when it detects someone entering the area with a hostile intent. Now, you can be an enemy of the caster without having hostile intent, but only if they have hostile intent and it doesn't distinguish between friendly and hostile. Hostile intent, friendly and enemy fighters who enter the zone, you know, just somebody who's intended to harm somebody, the market alerts it. They don't match up what's going on. And I had this in my first campaign. In fact, my first scenario, my first campaign, there's a great market down at the Sundome Temple. And there was this guy who was, you know, going through the stalls and stuff and saw a fellow that. was in an opposing organization and so he killed him so we were figuring out how did somebody get murdered inside well he, he entered it with knowing hostile intent he didn't know the guy was there he was just going to the market but was he an enemy of the caster not at all i didn't even know who the caster was yeah. uh, consistency and that's where we'll end happy gaming